All right, uh, welcome to the webinar. I'm just going to uh, go ahead and turn this video off. Uh, my name is Chris Madrid French and I'm with San Francisco Heritage and Rocket. If you'd like to go ahead and turn on your audio and video and we can get started. Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for coming to our town hall. My name is Rocket, I'm part of a grassroots organization called the San Franciscans to Save the Castro Theater formed by Terry Beswick and myself. We put this town hall together out of love and care for our community and our theater because we're passionate about preserving the queer cultural heritage site that is the Castro, and we know you are too. We're allied with the Castro Theater Conservancy, the Friends of the Castro Theater Coalition, and supporting the preservation of the interior character defining features of the historic movie palace. Um, I'd like to introduce you to our fabulous moderator for tonight's town hall, which is Christine French of the San Francisco Heritage um, Foundation. Thank you so much, Christine, for uh, helping support our town hall tonight. Oh, you're welcome, Rocket. And I'm going to just go over a couple of things. I'm going to try to get that chat working. I think I might have disabled it by accident. But what I want to do is start with a poll for everybody who's participating. Uh, we have a public participation poll. Um, you can see that people are already answering um, this poll. So go ahead and answer that if you want. What we're interested in is finding out uh, how much you've worked with, uh, how much you've commented. Are you comfortable commenting at the many meetings that we've had uh, regarding the Castro Theater? So just a couple of things. We are going to have an extended question and answer period at the end uh, with plenty of time for everybody to get something in. Uh, you can use the Q&A box that's at the bottom. And we have a, it should, the capability to upvote a question that you're interested in, it should be on. And so if you see a question you like, you can upvote it. And then we'll be um, handling all the questions at the end. So we have a number of really great uh, people here who are gonna share um, the information about how to participate in the, the public uh, part of the HPC meetings, the Board of Supervisors meetings, many of these, the Planning Commission meetings that are coming up regarding the Castro Theater. So we'll be using that Q&A towards the end. I will try to get the chat working. If I do, you'll see it, I will post in there. And I can see from our public participation poll that uh, a lot of people are planning to go to the June 8th joint hearing of the historic preservation and planning commissions. And quite a few people, 47% have participated in these meetings before, which is, makes me very pleased that people are, are uh, participating. So I uh, am, I, I am the Director of Advocacy Programs and Communications at San Francisco Heritage, and it is a real pleasure for me to bring some of these uh, professional people to you and community advocates talking about the Castro. If you have any issues at all, you can communicate with me in the chat window. I believe it still works. And we are recording this for everyone to watch again later. So I'm gonna go ahead and end that poll. Um, what I'd like to do is start with a video that we have, and it's just gonna take me one second because I need to make sure I have everything opened appropriately for you all. And um, this is um, Eddie Moeller, uh, who is a host of Film Noir and, and Turner Classic Movies, wanted to send us, he couldn't attend today in person, but he did want to send a comment. We thought this would be the best way to get the conversation started. I will share my screen and we will get going with that. My name is Eddie Muller. I am one of the hosts of Turner Classic Movies. I am also the founder and president of the Film Noir Foundation, which rescues and restores classic films. And for almost 20 years, I have been the producer and host of the Noir City Film Festival, which for most of those years has taken place at the Castro Theater, which you see behind me. One of the sold out shows that we've done over the years at the Castro Theater. Uh, I wanted to speak today not on behalf really of the Conservancy, certainly not on behalf of another planet entertainment, but on behalf of the movie going audience in the greater Bay Area, which is the greatest in America and one of the greatest worldwide. And their support of the Noir City Film Festival at this theater over the years has entitled me to a second career because of the success of it. I've made a lot of money for the Nasser family and enough to restore films based just on filling this theater for movies. 
And I wanted to just address two major misconceptions um, that have plagued this whole process of trying to transition from the Castro being a single screen movie theater to a performing arts venue. Um, that is something that has been achieved in many places around the United States with majestic old movie palaces and vaudeville houses, performing art spaces being converted to multi-use facilities without the necessity of changing the historical integrity of the building, i.e. not removing the original orchestral seating. I think this would be devastating to film shows there and it is very disingenuous of the proposed management of the theater to suggest that everything would continue along as it has, uh, because I can tell you that film festivals such as mine, uh, I won't speak for the other very significant festivals in San Francisco, but the added cost of doing these shows with having to bring in temporary seating, with having to uh, provide projection that was always part of the rental agreement with the theater would just be prohibitively expensive in this environment uh, for those festivals to succeed. Uh, it, it just doesn't have to happen. And I really think that going forward, cooler heads need to prevail here because the the culture of San Francisco and basically what it stands for is at a crossroads right here because this is the last remaining movie palace in San Francisco. It can be operated on a nonprofit basis for all kinds of arts, for music, for dance, for comedy uh, and movie shows. All of this can be done without removing those seats because I'm telling you right now, the purpose of that is to really sell alcohol and to have alcohol stations in the venue for kids coming to concerts. And if San Francisco chooses to prioritize alcohol over art, I feel we have reached that crossroads where this is no longer the city that knows how. It might have been the city that knew how, but this is a very, very vital decision. Will San Francisco be a world-class city for the arts, or will it just be another venue catering to young people who just want to have a good time and pour out in the streets kind of tanked up after an evening's entertainment. It's possible to achieve this, uh, but it is really imperative that the historical seating remain. Thanks for your attention. Welcome, Jesse, you're up. Hi, everyone. I'm Jesse Oliver Sanford, and I've been participating in the public conversation regarding the Castro Theater uh, since early 2022. Um, today, I'm speaking entirely in my personal capacity as a 17-year resident of Castro Street, um, where I live half a block from the theater. If queers want to keep the Castro, we need to own it. And I view this as being as true of the theater as it is of the rest of the neighborhood. There is no reason in the world why our community can own and manage our own community temple. In the Castro, with LGBTQ visitors from all over the world, we work every day to connect, inspire, and sustain our community's global civil rights movement. The highest and best use of the Castro Theater would be as the nation's premier LGBTQ-centered venue. The Radio City Music Hall for Gay People, said John Waters. This requires owners and management who know the community and are relentless in working toward this goal. Fundamentally, we should favor a nonprofit or queer owned, community centered, LGBTQ centered Castro Theater because the alternative is corporate control and exploitation. The larger the organization, the less likely its interests will align with those of our still oppressed LGBTQ community. Oppressed communities need to discover and teach the next generation who they are and what their interests are. We need our own face-to-face -face communication in our own places of assembly. Another planet showed up as a bully in the Castro because they were already a bully. As an organization, they choose friends and enemies, chilling out all those who don't get in line with their priorities. Their business model is about vertical monopolization. They both represent artists and control the venues those artists need. 
Artists and producers become financially and logistically dependent, and they fear retribution if they speak out. You know, some see empty storefronts, they hear promises of investment, investment that the Nassers, who reportedly netted as much as a million dollars each year from theater operations, would not make. And they conclude that the future means, means gutting the past. But with live entertainment attendance still down after the pandemic, and the one to two night a week calendar typical of another planet's other venues, and in-house liquor sales, the economic, of another, the economic benefit of another planet's proposal for the rest of the neighborhood looks dubious and certainly less than we need. The social impact looks even worse. The theater empty on many dark nights, seats likely stored off site to be trucked in for special occasions, and random crowds who don't know the neighborhood or its norms. Look, the moment now is difficult. We face setbacks at City Hall. We've been betrayed by our representative, Raphael Mandelman, who has chosen to side with a narrow posse of white, affluent, moderate young men, with the HRC gays who appear to believe in capitalism, consumerism, and assimilation, instead of with the full diversity of our queer community. Yet as they say, it is always darkest before dawn. I think back to August, when 800 people turned out for the town hall at the Castor Theater itself, a crowd overwhelmingly opposed to another planet's plans. If we can turn out half, maybe even a quarter of that number to City Hall on June 6th and 8th, wearing red or maybe even pink, we'll show Raphael and the other supervisors that there's no future for them in politics if they betray their base. We'll make the same point to the rest of the city, and when it comes time for the Board of Supervisors to vote, we're likely to win. I hope everyone in this call tonight leaves with a clear idea of what we have to do to turn this fight around. I hope each of you will write down the key dates, times, and places to show up on June 6th and, of course, on June 8th at the joint, the joint hearing of the HPC and the Planning Commission. I hope you'll go identify four friends who feel about the Castor Theater as you do and then call them. Don't just email or post on Facebook. Actually call people. Actually talk to them in person. Ask them if they will join you in showing up and ask them if, in turn, they'll call four more friends who also want to see the theater end up in LGBTQ hands. Then, on the mornings of June 6th and 8th, remind your friends to show up and ask them to remind theirs. That's how we'll spread the word and turn out in massive numbers. That's how we'll turn this thing around. This is an easy win for us if we show up and put our bodies on the line. I know we can do it because I know our community is strong. We've overcome so much together. We're continuing to learn and grow and evolve generation by generation. Whatever happens next week, we're not going away and we'll be relentless in making our voices heard. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was uh, wonderfully said. And I have opened the chat window and we are monitoring that. If you'd like to share ideas and thoughts with the panelists and the other people in the community, uh, you can do so. And we just want to make sure everyone is respectful and civil in our chat window. Uh, also, you can start posting in the question and answer uh, tab. And we are um, actually answering some of those questions as they come up and you can read the answers under the answered tab of the Q&A. So next up, we have Tom, if you'd like to go ahead and start your audio and video. All right, we're just waiting for Tom to go ahead and start his audio and video. Sorry, I was just reminding him in the in the window. There we go. Welcome, Tom. Go ahead and introduce yourself and you have the floor. Oh, you're still muted, Tom. There, yeah, how's that? That's great. great. That's great. Got me now? Sorry for the Luddite stuff. Um, I just want to say, you know, I'm really humbled and and inspired by the two previous speakers. Um, it not only comes from the heart, uh, but it, it it's also the intellect. Um, we, I think we're so underrated as a community. Uh, you know, we are not sheep. And uh, that was really hit on by the speakers. And um, I, I, you know, I'm an OG I've been with the Castro Theater and what it means for many, many years. And uh, there, there, there's a lot of emotional fabric here. Uh, and this, this is going to be a win for us. 
Um, it comes down to political will. Um, and I am very disappointed in uh, the queer members of the Board of uh, Supervisors. This should have been uh, a slam dunk. You know, people like to um, uh, uh, kind of grandstand on the legacy of Harvey Milk, but I don't, I don't see Harvey Milk in uh, any of the um, uh, responses or lack of responses from the queer members. And uh, Jesse is totally right. They have to have consequences. Um, you know, a lot of it comes down to really ugly things. Uh, politics is a blood sport. We're very, very uh, uh, well acquainted with that. Uh, you know, it's like riding a bicycle. We've gotten a little comfortable about some of our advances, particularly here in San Francisco, but we're also getting screwed. And so, you know, that's that spirit that uh, drove uh, Harvey Milk, the empowerment. Uh, you know, there's a difference between gay pride and and gay liberation and gay pride. Fine, fine. We, we, we need to tell the public we are affirmed and we are welcoming and that we and don't mess with us. But gay liberation is different. Gay liberation is what this Castro theater is all about. We own the Castro theater. Cultural eminent domain whatever you want to say. At City Hall, I'm well acquainted with how it works. And it's never over at City Hall. Even if there's a vote that doesn't go your way, there are ways around that if we present ourselves in a unified fashion uh, as we are doing during this webinar, but, but also from the average person on the street. Um, I don't want to create false dichotomies here. But, you know, as an older person, I've heard a lot of diminishment of, you know, you're old and the future. And Jesse said it quite well. But without the recognition and embracing of the past, the future is a dim one. There's no spirit. It's all penciling in. If I have to hear that one more time. The Nasters are about the money. All right, fine. Then let's deal with it. Um, I have to look at the details of the alternate plan, but it does give you a taste of the um, games people play. Well, why don't you come up with an alternate plan? You come up with an alternate plan, they're gonna find some other kind of criticism. Um, but I think we, as much as we can, we need to educate to uh, people who are on the fence, people who don't know the history of the Castro Theater in the way we assume they know and what it means. I saw a posting uh, recently of the history of the Castro Theater. It was very enlightening even for me. So the more education we can put out there, and you know, the burden is gonna be on us. It always is when you have an, uh, an opinion uh, that's humanistic, that really is what the community wants. You know, you're diminished, you're ridiculed. Um, uh, we're strong, we have the armor. So, uh, Again, uh, I wanna encourage you that we, we can win this. I am so impressed with your organization, your mobilization, uh, and most of all the spirit that I've heard so far. So um, let's see what happens. Uh, I'll be there. Uh, hopefully I get my Zoom to work if I, if I can attend personally. And I definitely pledge to keep advertising this on, uh, on my Facebook and uh, uh, educating people about it. I went to the Italian American seminar, uh, seminar, uh, a festival a few months ago, and the people there did not know that this was happening. So I was happy to share that, uh, in only way an Italian can by saying, salve de poste, save the seats and don't fuck with us. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Tom, and uh, thank you, Jesse. Also, uh, you know, I really take a lot of inspiration from both of you. Um, my name is Terry Beswick, and I founded uh, this group, San Franciscans to Save the Castro Theater, with uh, my friend Rocket. And this is our first uh, first event, actually. So I really want to welcome everyone for participating uh, tonight. Um, and I appreciate all the chats and Q and A that we're getting, also. Um, and I've been asked just to talk briefly as impartially as I can about what APE plans to do 
uh, for the Castro th with the Castro Theater, and um, uh, and then later we're going to talk more uh, specifically about the regulations that are at play, the uh, legislation that's at play, and how we're going to influence those. So, just briefly, I, I want to uh, say for those who may not know the basic facts, what we're talking about. Another Planet Entertainment, of course, is a concert promoter. They have a number of different venues around the Bay Area and beyond. Uh, including the Bill Graham Auditorium, the Independent. Uh, they run the Outside Lands of, uh, Festival in Golden Gate Park every summer and so on. And so they uh, contract with the city, work very closely with the city on these projects. Um, they took over the lease of the Castro Theater about a year and a half ago. Um, and their stated intention is to evolve the uh, movie space from its primary movie screening origins to a more flexible entertainment venue. Uh, their programming and their renovations and remodeling and their restoration plans are the things that I just want to touch on, what they say that they're going to do and what we're talking about today. So first of all, the programming. Um, so uh, first of all, it's important to note that the uh, the theater has been closed, for, uh, largely closed for a few years. It was closed during the pandemic. When Ape took over a year and a half ago, uh, they began some sporadic uh, programming, but it has been closed for months at a time. Uh, and certainly weeks at a time with occasional concerts and rentals to film festivals and other presenters. So if their permits are approved, the theater will again be closed for remodeling for an un unknown period of time, could be a year, could be longer. And then post remodel, APE has said that they will activate the theater on average for 175 days per year, which is of course less than half the year. And of those 175 days, some 57 or 33% will be dedicated to film and some 43 nights or 25% will, will include LGBTQ programming. So there's a lot of ambiguity about those numbers that has been discussed quite a bit, but I wanna point out a few things. First of all, according to their own estimations, the theater will be closed virtually all daytimes and over half the nights annually. Secondly, APE could conceivably achieve its stated goal of 57 film screenings simply by renting out to several uh, film festivals, and that would be accomplished. The 25% LGBTQ programming is not defined, and APE has stated to me that they are already achieving this go goal in their other venues simply by programming uh, musical acts that include LGBTQ among their, their band members and that kind of thing. So. There's a lot of ambiguity about what all this means, but we what, what we, we do know is that they're saying the theater will be closed post remodel more than half the year. Um, they talk a lot about renovations and restoration, but there's actually very little that they're planning to do with the millions of dollars that they say that they're going to spend on um, renovations. The renovations are about the ceiling, the wall murals, the original proscenium, uh, would be cleaned and restored, lighting fixtures would be replaced. The rest of it is really remodeling. And of course, what's been most con contentious is the leveling of the orchestra floor, replacing it with a mechanical device that retracts several tiers for concerts and adds back multiple tiers for seating. The permanent movie palace seating would be removed. Temporary seats would be stacked, uh, uh, stackable padded chairs like you would find in churches or in hotel conference rooms. The lobby concession counter would be removed or replaced with a full bar. There would be two full alcohol bars installed in the back of the theater uh, itself, the auditorium itself, with additional full bars installed on the mezzanine upstairs on the balcony level. There would be a metal scissored gate across the front of the movie theater, closed and blocking view of the box office and the tiled exterior entrance area when there are no shows, which would, would of course be most of the time. There would also be other changes to the stage and to the dressing room area. Uh, dressing room area would be added. There would be improvements made, of course, which are you know improvements to the HVAC, mechanical lifts for wheelchairs to move between the different tiers of the floors of the orchestra, and there is of course a number of deferred maintenance issues that need to be addressed. Um, another organization has, of course, uh, raised the money to replace the uh, Wurlitzer uh, organ, um, and APIS said that they will install a lift to uh, install that organ. 
Um, and uh, so uh, that's these are all good things. Undefined improvements to the restroom, of course, as well. So I just wanted to lay out that these are the, the proposals. The key thing, of course, that we're focusing here on today is this is the removal of the fixed seating and the uh, uh, removal of the uh, uh, raked floor of, of the auditorium, which, uh, of course, everyone that we talk to among the groups that are sponsoring this event believe would uh, essentially decimate the last remaining movie palace in San Francisco and uh, um, and really displace the LGBTQ culture of the Castro and of San Francisco. So with that, um, we're going to get on to talking more about the legislation and the other other uh, actions that we can take around the commission work. But first, next, we want to turn it over to Peter Pastriche to talk about the Castro Theater Conservancy Plan. Hi, I'm Peter Pastreich, Executive Director of the uh, San Francisco uh, of the uh, Castro Theater Conservancy. Last April 26th, the Castro Theater Conservancy released a detailed proposed plan for operating the Castro Theater. We did so being fully aware that the Castro Theater is owned by the Nasser family through their real estate company, Bay Properties, and that the Nasser family has a lease arrangement with a, another Planet Entertainment for APE to operate the Castro Theater. So the Conservancy is proposing a plan under those circumstances has to qualify for what my mother would have called chutzpah. We propose the plan nevertheless to make it clear that there is an alternative to APE's plan to convert San Francisco's last single screen movie palace into a nightclub best suited for live music concerts performed for a standing drinking audience and poorly suited for cinema. It's become clear to virtually everyone who cares about the Castro Theater and the community the theater has served for over 100 years that APE's plan to destroy the orchestra floor of the Castro, removing the movie seats and flattening the floor and leaving the theater dark more than half the time is not an ideal plan for anyone except APE itself. And the APE plan can be stopped if six supervisors vote to landmark the theater's interior, including fixed theatrical seating configured in movie palace style, and if the Historic Preservation Commission refuses to issue a certificate of appropriateness to APE, permitting them to remove the theatrical seating despite its being landmarked. If those two things happen, as they should happen, we don't know what APE and the Nassers will do. They have said they'll close the theater, but that would be a spiteful response and one that would be costly to them both. APE might decide they can make money at the Castro in spite of its, of its having theatrical seating and a sloping floor. They make money at numerous other venues with those characteristics. If they make that decision, the Conservancy will continue to encourage the showing of films and the presentation of significant number of LGBTQ plus related events. And we will feel that we have succeeded in our original goal to save the Castro Theater. But if APE denied the permits, it, it says it must have to make a profit, elects to walk away from the lease with Bay Properties we hope the NASA family will then consider seriously, as they have not done so far, the Conservancy's proposal to operate and renovate the Castro Theater and to run it as a nonprofit. It is a proposal that promises to have the theater active 365 days a year and to renovate the building to make it safe, comfortable, and accessible and restored to its former beauty. The Nassar's and Supervisor Mandelman have objected to the Conservancy's plan on the basis of it not being, quote, funded. Let me say, first of all, that the APE plan isn't funded either. All we have are promises that APE will install motorized risers st and stacking chairs, 
We'll engage experts to restore the murals and the theater's ceiling, and we'll improve HVAC and the theater's sound system. We know that these promises are not enforceable and that APE has not kept all of its promises at other venues. But what about the Conservancy's funding? Our plan calls for the first two years of our operation of the Castro to include only the most urgent capital improvements. We must get the water out of the basement, get the heating and air conditioning working, install a Dolby sound system, repair the blade Castro sign, and make at least the, the orchestra floor of the theater more accessible. Restoring the murals, scaffolding the theater so the ceiling can be restored as well, uncovering a long lost proscenium arch, adding additional toilets, making the remainder of the theater accessible. These are not urgently required changes and they can wait for the major capital campaign the Conservancy would launch toward the end of our second year of operating the Castro, a campaign backed by architectural plans by a first-rate architect and a design that will deal with issues accessibility, improved rest restroom facilities, and audience comfort not contemplated by APE in their plans. The Conservancy's first two years of Castro Theater operations are funded. We have pledges of contributions sufficient for the urgent capital improvements and the daily operation of the theater during that period. First, the Conservancy will build membership and a strong board of directors. Then it will prove its value to the community and only then it will raise the money needed. I can't think of an organization that first had a capital fund drive and then built community support. It's what we refer to as ready, fire, aim. Have asked the Conservancy to demonstrate now that we have funding, by which they mean the funding or part of the funding necessary to pay for the repairs to the theater the Nassers have neglected to make over the years of owning and operating the Castro. And that the Nassers tell us, none of us has actually seen the green the agreement between them and APE that APE has promised to do. At the same time, Supervisor Mandelman reminds us that even if we raise those funds, the Nashes might still refuse to work with the, with the Conservancy. We do not accept the argument that no matter what, only APE can run the Castro. The responsibility now is with the Board of Supervisors and especially with Supervisor Raphael Mandelman. He knows that APE, however good they are as managers and presenters of rock and pop concerts, is the wrong operator for the Castro Theater. Their unwillingness to engage with the leadership of the LGBTQ plus community and their open disdain for cinema is enough to demonstrate that the Friends of the Castro Theater Coalition, the Cultural District, the San Francisco Heritage, the Harvey Milk, LGBTQ Democratic Club, the San Franciscans to save the Castro Theater, the Castro Theater Conservancy, and thousands of Castro Theater fans have demonstrated their courage in standing up in opposition to APT, APE and its plans. We call on Supervisor Mandelman to demonstrate his courage as well. Thank you. Hi, this is Jeffrey Kwong. I'm president of the Harvey Milk LGBTQ Democratic Club. And I want to echo what Peter has started to say, but I wanted to highlight the real need for driving up turnout for the eighth. Folks are wearing red to the Board of Supervisors meeting to emphasize that connection with the seats. But really, it's more than just the seats. It's about protecting um, our community. The AP is in the driving seat. They own the lease for Castro Theater, but that doesn't mean that we don't have a role to play. We are the stewards of the community. We are the stewards of Castro Theater. I remember singing for the first time during Christmas Eve in the Castro Theater with the Gay, gay Men's Chorus, um, with all of the community, those that had no family to go to, that had to find a place 
to celebrate and they found it in the Castro theater. Our embodiment is resistance. Uh, we have to build connections to ourselves and each other and every day we are threatened um, by AP, by the mainstream that seek to impose um, their ideas of what belongs in our community. We have to play our part. We have been holding multiple, um, multiple meetings to plan out what our talking points are, what our next steps are with adequate consultation with our community stakeholders, with groups like our club, with other political organizations, with cultural districts, and the same cannot be said about APE. So it's important for us to uh, attend the June 8th meeting uh, and to frame it in a way that uh, AP has not made any concessions to preserve our community, to preserve community access. Um, the seats, uh, in my mind, are one of many issues, but it's an embodiment of what AP will do to sacrifice uh, a key cultural landmark, a uh, key in, uh, tangible cultural asset that this community has. Um, it represents the broken promises that uh, AP has made to our community. Others have mentioned this, but it's so important to emphasize to the Board of Supervisors and Supervisor Peskin mentioned this, that the city can't do anything to go after AP, to hold them accountable for uh, promising millions of dollars of re renovation at Bill Graham Civic Auditorium and delivering on um, a much significantly smaller amount of promising to renovate the Fox Theater but only contributing 25,000 out of a $75 million plan. They defaulted on a $1.2 million loan. They won't even allow the Oakland School of the Arts, um, a school that serves a pre pre predominantly disadvantaged community to use the Fox Theater as they originally promised when they gained the lease uh, of that theater. It's important for us to emphasize that to the board. Um, and at this point, we are working on three uh, supervisors. That's uh, Catherine Stephanie, District 2, which is the Marina, um, Seacliff, uh, Pack Heights. It's uh, uh, Supervisor Safai and also represent, uh, Supervisor Rafael Mandami. It's important for all of us to turn out to make sure that they hear our voices uh, and make sure that June 8th, it's all about reaching the commissioners uh, in making sure that uh, our plan passes. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris. Thank you so much, uh, Jeffrey. So I will, I'm will. i going to talk about the joint hearing of the Historic Preservation Commission and the Planning Commission that is planned for June 8th. I'm gonna share my screen because there are a lot of details. This is a meeting that has been uh, postponed a couple of times. And I just wanted to make sure that everybody has the right information on this. So it will be occurring on June 8th, 2023 at 10 a.m. in City Hall, room 400. Uh, to participate, uh, you can attend in person. They will be taking public comment, or you can call in, uh, or you can send a letter. And um, we have Alex Westhoff and Rich Sucre in the uh, back end of the webinar, and they can answer any um, logistical questions that anyone in the audience might have. It's very important when you are participating in this public process to uh, tailor your comments to specifically address what the agenda items are. So I wanted to uh, show you about that. The agenda will be published a week in advance and available for download at sfplanning.org. Uh, so the uh, next page has the couple of things that we need to just talk about. So there are going to be uh, this is a very unusual, there have, has not been a joint Historic Preservation Commission and planning meeting in at least the last four years. So this is an opportunity for the public to participate in both uh, meetings on the same day. And this is why it's starting at 10 a.m. rather than the usual um, noon or afternoon time. At the Historic Preservation Commission is going to be uh, looking at the request for certificate of appropriateness. I've put all of this text up online for you to read while we're discussing. Uh, it's important to note that as Jeffrey mentioned, the Board of Supervisors are meeting a couple of days in advance so that the Historic Preservation Commission um, 
the, uh, as far as I understand it, the agenda might change a little bit depending on what happens, but um, that might be a question we can talk about. So the request for certificate of appropriateness is going to be for interior and exterior alterations to the theater. At this point, the exterior is uh, part of the landmark uh, declaration and parts of the interior are what are being discussed at the Board of Supervisors, including the seating that we are concerned about. So you can see that the Historic Preservation Commission will be looking at all of these items. So you could address these in any kind of letter or public comment. The uh, Planning Commission will be looking at two things separately and together. Uh, the Planning Code Amendment, which is the ordinance to change the zoning controls that allows nighttime entertainment with a conditional use authorization on the second floor. So at this point, the Castro Street neighborhood does not allow nighttime entertainment on the second floor. And this would be uh, to allow the balcony, I believe, to be used as part of that. And then the second conditional use the conditional use authorization that the Planning Commission will be reviewing is to establish nighttime entertainment and bar use on the first and second stories alongside the existing movie theater use uh, within the existing building. And this requires a legislative amendment to the planning code. So you can see why I created a, a PowerPoint just for this information so that we could make sure that you have everything that you need to, to address this. All of this can be seen at um, on sfplanning.org as we get a little bit closer to that meeting date. And I think um, Rocket, now would be a good time. I'm gonna stop my share and Rocket had uh, some information to share as well uh, about participating. Right, thank you. So this is all the information that you need. Uh, and you can even use that QR code on the screen if you have your phone handy. You can go to that link for talking points and have link to send letters to the Board of Supervisors. And that is the June 6th meeting. And then June 8th, we are all right back at City Hall for that second one. So uh, all of this information is going to be in the recording. And of course, you can uh, go to the Facebook. Rocket, maybe you could post in the chat where they people can, what your Facebook link is for this event that has, um, that has this information in it if people want to copy it or share it with their friends. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to start the Q&A, the community Q&A. We have a lot of questions in the Q&A box. So if all of the panelists would like to go ahead and start their audio and video, and if you can't, just um, text me and I will, I'm just gonna run through here and let everybody come on if they would like to. Um, and we'll do sort of a, a discussion. If you have a Q&A for a specific panelist, I'll be moderating the, the questions. Let me get some okay. cameras on here. Let's see. <laughs> Okay, good. Now we're getting some people in here. And Chris, then Yeah, could I could I start with a question just to Yeah, get go question? ahead, Terry, while I'm getting everybody's cameras going. Okay. Uh, this is a question I just put in the chat, and it's really for Rich and Alex. I hope that this is a technical enough question and not getting into, you know, the decision making process that the commission itself needs, the joint commissions themselves need to uh, carry out. But so the technical question that I have is, if the Secretary of Interior's standards require that changes to character defining features is reversible, how can the Planning Commission approve a project that demolishes the CDFs? the character defining features, which are the raked floor and the historic seating configuration. Um, yeah, so I just uh, wanted to, re we, they cannot actually, so Rich and uh, Alex are here to answer any procedural questions about the meetings and not the actual content of said meetings. So if they're here, uh, if, they, if you have a question about how could you send your letters in, uh, and what is, involved in, in that, that's my understanding. So Rich, did you wanna maybe go over what you can uh, talk sure, about? Sure, hi everyone, I'm Rich Sucre. I'm the deputy director of the current planning division um, with San Francisco Planning and I help lead our historic preservation group. Happy to answer any questions on the procedures and process for the public hearing. Um, we look forward to getting any comments that you might have 
on the particular proposal, which we'll forward on to both the Planning Commission and the Historic Preservation Commission um, at our joint meeting on, um, which is currently scheduled for June, Thursday, June 8th um, at 10 a.m. Um, so we're happy to accept any um, uh, commentary on the project itself. Um, a version of the case packet has already been issued. And then as Chris had mentioned, another version will be <clears throat> published a week in advance um, if there's been any additional edits. Um, Alex Westhoff can also help facilitate anyone that needs to review any project plans um, or has any um, difficulty in reviewing any of the material. So happy to, happy to be here as a resource. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Christine, I just need to push a little back on, on this because my understanding is that the Planning Commission staff has made a recommendation to the commissions to approve the Another Planet Entertainment proposals, uh, specifically around removing the seats and changing the permanent seating configuration. And what I'm asking is a technical question, I think, really, which is about the Secretary of Interior standards, which require that any kind of changes to the permanent structure of, of the site be reversible. And so my question is, how can you recommend that these proposals go forward if in fact they are uh, pre precluded by the Secretary of Inter Interior's uh, standards? Sure, I'm happy to uh, address some of your questions, Terry. So a good way to help understand the two commissions and their role, um, the Historic Preservation Commission is in charge of the landmarking and any of the work that happens to the exterior and the interior um, that's subject um, to the landmark ordinance. Um, while the Planning Commission is really about the uses of the theater. So things dealing with, um, for example, the potential for alcohol sales or for the conversion to um, general entertainment is mainly what the planning commission um, will weigh in on and approve. So um, the historic preservation commission is our main body um, for guiding and you know <laughs> maintaining uh, work towards our city landmarks. The Castro is one of our city landmarks and um, supervisor Mandelman's ordinance obviously would expand the landmarking towards the interior. Um, the secretary of interior standards are really a philosophical framework for analyzing historic resources. So ultimately, like when we look at a project and a historic building in particular, we look at the totality of the things, like what I make it akin to is, um, could you change out a window on a building and, and still have the building uh, maintain its historic character and its historic features? So the character defining features are a kind of many list of uh, buildings that help kind of emblematically show what um, what is historic and what's not within a within a property. So, um, so we the standards don't preclude you from specifically um, saying yes and no to specific things. They provide like a larger framework for analysis. Ultimately, for us to provide a recommendation to our decision makers, um, who then you know weigh in on on the totality of that, factoring in both the analysis from planning staff, but also from you know, the public commentary and um, the direction given by our board of supervisors. I appreciate that. And just one quick follow-up on a slightly different question. So the board of supervisors is going to vote on the 6th. Um, now, if they put through the ordinance, the landmarking ordinance, with the language that was added in committee protecting the seats, um, uh, is that going to change the staff recommendation to the commissions um, and or influence the commission's decision? And can the commission throw that out and say that, no, we're, we're not going to protect the seats? The, the, the commission ultimately has the responsibility for ensuring that the city landmark um, and its status as a landmark is maintained um, through the character defining features. Um, so ultimately, that's their charge is to make sure that the the um, landmark and its status are are maintained via the rules that we have that's been adopted by the city. Um, so that's the it, your your questions are kind of a hard one to to give you a straight answer to because it's not a straight answer, sadly. 
All right. Well, Rich. It's a very uh, good question. So I totally understand that. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I guess we're, we're really just trying to grapple with you know, uh, uh, whether the commissions are going to be influenced by the Board of Supervisors. Okay. Maybe others can address that. Uh, well, I want to thank uh, Rich and Alex definitely for helping us understand how this public process is, uh, is going along. Uh, just a reminder to our panelists, if you're not answering a question, if you can keep your microphones on mute so that we are going to go ahead and hit this Q&A. So um, I'm just going to start at the top, just a reminder to everybody who's participating in this webinar that you can up vote one, any of these questions that you're interested in seeing. I'm going to start at the top and go down to the bottom. You'll see a little thumbs up. Go ahead and hit that thumbs up if you like the question the most, and it'll raise it up to the top. Also, inside the answered ones, I saw we have some we still need to address. But I'm just going to go ahead and start at the beginning. So um, can we, there's, a, I guess, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, there's a lot in here. So here's one. Um, is there a list of features identified by preservation experts that will not be protected based on language in the report by SF planning? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, if anybody on the panel might know that, that would be a question that we should ask. Are there features identified by experts that will not be protected based on the language in the report by SF planning? Does anybody else want to answer that? We still have some questions that we need solved. I'm, I'm happy to chime in on this. Oh, okay, great. Thank you, Rich. To, to give a little insight. Um, so the landmark ordinance does include a list of character defining features. And then working with the preservation consultant, um, we also developed what we call significance diagrams, which basically look at how the relative significance of specific features towards the main characteristics of the building itself. So we have things that we basically highlight as green, basically meaning like they're very significant or things that are highlighted as red that are not significant um, towards that history. Um, and then things that are yellow are typically things that are the in-between, meaning that they may have been altered over time. Um, they don't clearly show a connection between um, the significance of the building um, and the space. And so those are usually opportunities for changes um, when we're looking at proposals. Uh, while I have you talking, Rich, what is the deadline to submit a letter for the Board of Supervisors and the joint HPC and planning meeting? Sure. Um, planning staff can actually accept comments basically up until the day of the hearing. Um, and then we transmit all of those comments over to our commissioners and provide a, a summary over to them. So um, basically up until the day, staff will accept your comments and forward them on to our commissioners. Um, the board is in the same um, kind of point of view, but um, anything received after that, they, the the board and the commissioners do review it, but may not be timely enough for the actual hearing itself. I have a question on my own behalf, or maybe just uh, something to tell everybody who's participating that if there are a lot of people uh, doing public comment, sometimes the comment period is shortened. You just never know. Sometimes it's three minutes, and occasionally I've gone and it's two, or it could even be as short as one minute if there are. A lot of people, and we want a lot of people to show up. So just be prepared with a one minute version and a three minute version of your comments. Um, here's another question that maybe Rich and Alex might have. Is there a historic structure support for the theater or information like that that the public can review and where would we find this report? I can, I can probably chime in on Thank that you, one. Alex. There is the closest thing we have to that is the historic interior finishes assessment that Evergreen Arts, they're um, the sub consultant to um, you know the broader project, but um, that basically shows a rehabilitation proposal for the ceiling, um, the proscenium, uh, the paintings, and uh, the Rondell murals. So um, that's the closest thing we have on hand to a historic structures report, and that's um, combined with the case report for um, the broader project. And Alex, is there a link where people can find that? Sure, yeah, that's um, that's attached to the case report. Um, so I can provide the link in the chat. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Um, I have a just, a, I'm just gonna go through these procedural questions first since we seem to be on this topic. So someone said they thought the June 8th meeting was due to be postponed until after the Board of Supervisors was able to vote. And I did post in that Q&A window that the June 6th supervise, Board of Supervisors meeting is going forward and then June 8th is the joint meeting. Uh, let's see. And I think that's all we have in here about procedural. 
Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and ask another question that might involve some of the other panelists. Uh, uh, this one I think would be great for Gerard, but he's not here today. So is the second period of historic significance, 1976 to 2004, related to the production of LGBTQ culture at the theater being viewed as valid? Um, and the seats on the main floor were installed during that period. Can somebody speak to, oh, Terry, uh, why don't you go ahead? Oh, I'm not an expert on that. Uh, <laughs> I think the question is having to do with the historic significance. That's really might be a question uh, of the of the uh, the period of historic significance of the um, existing seating. Can you talk about that, Alex? Is that something that would be? Uh, the, uh, sure. Well, I I wrote the landmark designation, so I updated it with the LGBTQ historic context, and um, Gerard was quite helpful in terms of developing a bibliography um, about the neighborhood context and you know the context of the theater as it relates to the LGBTQ community. So um, the the current seats were installed in two thousand one. So um, the the period of significance is largely just about um, um, you know the the history, the context, et cetera, and then character defining features are. Um, you know, identified based as features that um, support that context. So I'm not sure what 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 um, valid what what if um, there's more clarification I can provide. That's fine, but um, it's all uh, written in the landmark designation report, which I can also post a link to. Can I ask a question? Um, and I'm sorry to be a nuisance, Rich and Alex. I um, but in reading your recommend your reports to the commissions. Uh, uh, and your recommendations. Uh, there's some background material about the uh, uh, economic impact of the uh, proposed plans for the theater on the neighborhood, on, on the Castro. And I'm wondering, I looked at that and I wasn't clear on what data you were drawing on or what you were comparing it to, uh, but it seemed to be suggesting that APE's plans for the Castro Theater would be a boon to the neighborhood or would benefit the neighborhood, that the neighborhood has been suffering as a re result of COVID with a lot of storefront closings um, and that this would be a good thing. And my question is really about what are we comparing it to? Because Prior to the pandemic, it was open every day. There were matinees, there were evening productions. Many of them were sold out. Some of them were, you know, smaller audiences. Uh, but are we comparing it to that? Are we comparing it to being closed? Or are we comparing it to some abstract uh, um, uh, study of possible impacts? Uh, but it, there seemed to be a recommendation that, or an evaluation from the staff to the commissions that it would be of economic benefit to the neighborhood. Hey, Terry, I'm not super familiar with the section that you're talking about, but happy to follow up with you after this, and then we can chat about it once we review the material in more detail. Okay. I, I, Alex, do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, I'm guessing you're talking about the, um, the maybe the findings for the um, conditional use authorization. Yes, yes that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and there were there was a, uh, some statements in there about the economic impacts of Apes' plans for the Castro Theater. Yeah, yeah, you can always direct that at the at the hearing itself. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you all for those uh, for those answers. I have a question for Peter. Um, so, Peter, um, is there a way to make it? clear in the in the communications or how are you making it more clear in the communications that the conservancy uh, is not it's not just about the seats so let's just talk about that I know that that is something that the public is, is wondering like are you really trying to say like the original old seats that aren't very comfortable and then this argument is I think not been very clear so would you like to address that Peter yeah well I I don't think we've ever said that it was just about saving the seats Although saving the seats is obviously a part of what we care about. I, I, we started out, um, it's always been a movie theater, and that it needs to remain principally a movie theater, uh, which doesn't preclude uh, and has never precluded uh, concerts and, and other activities. Uh, the it's interesting to us that 
that um, APE claims that they will make the uh, more of a multi-use facility by taking out the seats. And it's just the opposite is true. When they take out the seats, they really turn it into a nightclub useful mainly for their kind of entity the kind of entertainment where people are standing and drinking. If they leave the seats in, there's almost nothing that you can't do in there. You can have comedy shows, you can have, uh, you can have uh, musical events of all kinds, and you can show film. Oh, thank you. And we had another question that, which was similar, which are the seats a contributing element to the theater's historic significance. So where what we're talking about with the interior landmarking of the theater, it's a, it, there's a lot, of, we call it tangible and intangible cultural heritage. And part of that intangible cultural heritage is the movies showing, which are included, I believe, in that in the interior landmarking. Um, I have another question. Uh, I lost it. Oh, I know. There's a proposed uh, security gate at the front of the theater. And I wondered if there, if um, Alex, you might be able to give us a link, like, is there a place we can view a drawing or something that shows what this uh, historic or, or what the gate might look like and then by thereby what we could uh, determine if it impacts the historic character of the Castro theater. It's one of the things that it showed on the HPC agenda. Uh, the plans from another plan entertainment are included as attachments to the case report. So, oh, okay. So I'll post the and, oh, and you just put chat. that in, did you just put that up on there on the chat yet? Yeah, typing it. Okay, okay. So uh, for that question, will the proposed security gate impact the historic character of the theater's exterior? Uh, Alex is posting the case report and in that will be is a diagram of what the security gate would look like. I have not spent a lot of time examining that. Uh, I'm an architectural historian. I would hope that, again, it's one of these things with the Secretary of Interior Standards. Is it a reversible? Does it change the, the does it have an impact on the original materials of the theater? That's something that um, I appreciate uh, you pointing that out and we can look at that. Um, I haven't heard from you yet, Jesse, and I didn't know if you saw anything in that Q&A that you would specifically be able to answer any of these questions that have been coming up. Yeah, so um, I know there have been reports that uh, APE hasn't been a great partner to the city in the Bill Graham venue. Um, I don't know the details, and it sounded like uh, there was some, in, in, you know, matter of interpretation there. So I'm hoping, I'm really hoping that we see um, some journalism around this. I think, you know, folks have to remember that part of the context of this is really um, a hollowing out of journalism in San Francisco over the course of the last 10 to 20 years, um, with all due respect to the folks who are in the office and in, in, the, in the town hall and appreciation to them um, for their work. You know, we just need a level of investigation um, around another planet's practices, um, their behavior to their patrons, their employees, and so forth. Um, that I think you know has has been hard to have um, in today's depleted media environment. So that's kind of a general answer, um, but um, I'm I'm hoping that folks can help out with the research here. And Jesse, if you have any um, hints on where people can read up more, you can go ahead and post some links in the in the chat, which uh, any background material. And just a reminder to anybody who's watching live on Facebook that I am monitoring our Facebook feed as well. Uh, it's at San Francisco Heritage uh, Facebook. And if you have a question, you can go ahead and post your comment uh, in Facebook uh, and I'll check those out as well. So um, yes, Jeffrey. And just to add to it, it was 2010 that the lease for Bill Graham Civic Auditorium was taken over by AP. And so it's been 13 years. They promised, I believe, was $10 million in capital improvements. And according to Supervisor and Peskin during the Land Use and Transportation Committee meeting, they have done zilch, zero of that $10 million in capital improvements to Bill Graham Civic Auditorium. And you see the caliber of shows they have brought in to that venue a concert space, EDM music, uh, top line artists, but they have spent zero dollars in doing those capital improvements. Uh, and as Supervisor Preston said, um, the best predictor of future behavior is the last 13 years of failed promises. So, uh, you know, and the city can't go after them, can't sue them, bring them to court. Um, 
and really without having this community input and having community involvement to hold their feet to the fire, none, none, none of this will happen. None of the promises will happen. Yes, thank you, Jeffrey. I think I saw that in the chat that somebody had mentioned that the, the nothing could be like codified, you know, any any of this kind of thing from, from APE, but it's not uh, enforceable is what is my understanding of that. It, yeah, it also, Christina, it brings up a whole range of issues. And, you know, there are certain promises that can be made, um, you know, just by putting it on the website in terms of community benefits or uh, offers to organizations uh, years out in terms of, you know, rentals and that kind of thing or partnerships um, it, that are completely impossible to enforce. But I think with regard to, uh, agreements that are brought forth before the commissions. Um, there is, you know, when when they get a conditional use authorization or a COA, um, I guess this might be a question for Rich and Alex. What enforcement mechanisms are there for a uh, follow up on that? And I guess it's kind of a rhetorical question because, you know, there can be agreements and then years out if they haven't met the agreements. Um, you know, there's there's really no, is there a fine that could be levied or would there just have to be a lawsuit levied or, what, you know, what, what would have to happen? Um, putting aside the fact that they're already in contract with the owners and it would be almost impossible for the owners to get them out and bring in a new tenant. Sure. So on the city's end, if we find that the sponsor is not fulfilling the conditions of approval um, specified by either our Historic Preservation Commission or our planning commission, we do have an active enforcement program and we do rely you know, heavily on our community partners to ensure that um, our sponsors are following through with what our commissions um, have basically specified for a project, particularly one like this in particular. So there is a fee program um, that was recently bolstered by Supervisor Peskin, uh, specifically geared for historic buildings in particular. Um, that might be availed, um, but basically we have to, ha you know, our team basically accepts um, complaints that are received and then researches them to ensure that, um, that the complaints are valid. And then if they are, they move on enforcement um, accordingly. Our, our, in full disclosure, our enforcement program isn't, isn't meant to be 100% punitive. Um, we do work with our spot, you know, our community to make sure that we try as hard as we can to bring people back into compliance um, with whatever the code is or with whatever the authorization was. If it ever came down to um, uh, that, you know, we thought that they weren't fulfilling the requirements, the planning commission does have the ability to revoke the conditional use authorization that they um, have specified. And then the sponsors would have to, you know, comply with the conditions that our commissions have done. Thank you, Rich, that was, that's good information. Um, I, I have a question for Peter. Uh, is the purpose of releasing the proposal to show that the Castro Theater Conservancy has a path forward and can and will raise the money or was it meant to make a model for the supervisors, a business model that can work with the seats intact, thereby negating the argument that we need to tear out the seats or the theater dies? So do you have uh, something to add to that uh, question? No, I, I think both are both are the case, Chris. Um, we we uh, uh, release the plan because uh, because it's a real plan, and because what we were hearing from the supervisors, and particularly from Supervisor Mendelman, was um, that there is no alternative to APE, and uh, we believe there is an alternative that the Conservancy's plan. Is is a realistic alternative to the APE plan. Thank you. Thank you Peter, very much. Yeah, go ahead, Terry. Yeah, Peter, I just want to follow up um, because uh, you know uh, these kinds of statements will not die easily. You, that we keep hearing over and over in the media that uh, the conservancy has no funding um, and that it doesn't have the capacity to get funding. And you did address that earlier. But I wonder if you can just speak specifically, like how would you, like if you got operation of the theater um, in a few months, how would you pay the bills? How would you begin to make those uh, renovations? Do you have money in the bank? 
And can you talk specifically about pledges? Like who has pledged how much? Um, I, I can tell you that we have, we have pledges from uh, several members of, the, uh, of what we call our working group, uh, which would be sufficient for at least the first couple of years of operation. Wow. Um, the, uh, I, I don't think I can tell you exactly how much has been pledged, uh, but we do, uh, we have, we have, first of all, we have been uh, operating, the Conservancy has, has spent some money, right? We've, uh, uh, since we, uh, we were established, uh, we have spent something uh, in the area of $200,000 100% of it contributed by our members. Uh, so it's so we've demonstrated our ability to raise some money. That's not the same as raising $20 million. And uh, $20 million, we, I don't have any doubt at all about that being raised, but it can only be raised once we have, once we have uh, the ability to say, yes, we have control of the theater, and we are presenting to the community the kind of activity that the community needs. Yeah, that, thank you for that. That's, that's, I think, probably as much as we could really expect to be said at this point. And to be fair, I think we should say that uh, nobody has asked to see Ape's checking account to see where is that $20 million coming from that they keep mm -hmm. throwing around. <laughs> You know, $20 million sounds like a lot of money, but I want to generally give folks some context on that. Um, that's, there are several other projects going on uh, in the Castro right now that are at that price level or above. Um, there is uh, the Harvey Milk Plaza renovation that I believe is expected to be in that range. Um, and, you know, I think there should be significant government funding for that, hopefully. Um, I think there's no reason that government funding is ruled out for the Castro Theater. Um, on the private side, we're talking about a small to mid-rise condo development. Um, you know, that's in the 20 to 30 million range. Um, and we have developers um, that, that we hear about um, in the course of some of my other work um, uh, fairly frequently um, who, who are looking at those kinds of budgets. So, uh, you know, um, it sounds like a lot of money and, um, you know, it it's, uh, definitely has to be raised. Um, but I think if we have the the political will there, um, that then we, we are going to be able to cross that bridge. Um, importantly, too, I think um, we really have not yet begun to fundraise um, in terms of really looking um, at the extent of support in the LGBT community and LGBT philanthropy. And partly that's because of the speculative nature of, of the fundraising right now. You know, I think um, you know, one, once there's a contract to operate the uh, the, the theater in a nonprofit model, um, I think it'll be possible to start um, making some more commitments around that, getting some more commitments around that. Thank you, Jesse. And as while I have you uh, unmuted, I was going to say, since you seem very familiar with the press here, so who are our friends in the press? I have a uh, question is BAR, Mission Local, 48 Hills, like who, where should we go for information through the press on this one? Yeah, you know, I don't know if I'm the best person to oh, okay. answer that. Um, <laughs> I'm definitely not the best one. I just Google everything. <laughs> yeah, um, hello hello to John from the BAR. I'm glad that you were able to be here. Um, and to Steve Bracco, I noticed, um, asked a question before. Um, and certainly thanks to all of you um, for, for your work. Um, it seems to me that what is involved now is a depth of investigative reporting. Um, it's been particularly challenging as well to... Uh, get the LGBT element of this story um, included in, um, in the wider mainstream press. Um, we had a segment on NPR at one point um, that really just went to the film piece and didn't actually really even describe um, what the Castro neighborhood is or, or, or why this is an LGBT issue. Um, so, you know, I'm not exactly sure um, who, who, who the folks are who have time and capacity to do the the, the gumshoe work on that, the the detective work, um, but um, you know, I I would definitely encourage um, in depth, hard hitting reporting on this issue. Can, can I say something about what encouraged us to believe that we could that the kind of money that needs to be raised can be raised? 
and that is what happened with the organ in in the in the Castro Theater uh, when when the the Taylor family uh, moved from the Bay Area they offered the organ to the Nasser family and the Nassers refused to buy it from them so they took the organ every pipe and, and aspect of it and took it took it with them to wherever they were moving uh, the uh, David Haggerty then formed a group to raise 1.3 million dollars to replace the organ now I, I have a little experience with raising money for organs uh, because I was involved in raising the money for the organ in Davy Symphony Hall this is a hard sell people don't give a damn about organs in the and well, the, the people who do don't have a lot of money well, they raised $1.3 million and they did it in about a year. Uh, and they got the money from th the usual suspects, the Osher Foundation, the Dee Dee Wilsey, the people who support things that matter in this community. Uh, and I, I know those people, I've raised money from them. And if they'll give 1.3 million to put an organ in the hall, and by the way, <laughs> Haggerty had no agreement with the Nasher's that they would accept the organ or that they would uh, or, or that they would uh, put in a lift large enough to, to move the organ up and down. And without even without that, they raised one point three million dollars. If you can raise one point three million dollars for an organ, you can raise 20 million, 30 million dollars to fix up the building. I'm I'm totally convinced of that. I think uh, I, I heard a good quote from somebody at one of these meetings that said, nobody's ever regretted uh, a saving or, or reusing the old building, but there's been a lot of regrets if we don't do it right. Uh, so I think that this is a, such a sensitive topic and the building is so critically important to the community. And I wanted to ask mm -hmm. uh, you, Terry, a, a question or, or to all of you a question. There's a couple of things on here that I'd like to, to get to in the, in the Q&A. What are some, what's some suggested language and terminology that people could use for the letters that they want to send to uh, the Board of Supervisors or the Historic Preservation Commission on this issue? I think that um, Rocket, but that might be in that QR code, like some suggested terminology, but Terry, do you have any specific suggestions for people who are listening today? Yeah, uh, and we'll, we'll uh, Rocket um, and I will, put in the chat, uh, the Save the Castro Theater Coalition, they have uh, a, uh, a form letter that you can send to the Board of Supervisors and you can go to the website and just click the Action Network and you can generate the, uh, the text of the letter or you can modify it to put in your personal story to go along with that text. Um, which is really the most powerful for you to like write about why the Castro Theater is important for you, why you think it's important that the seats stay, uh, whether it's about film preservation or LGBTQ cultural preservation. Um, uh, so there's there's text there that you can use, and you can also use this. We're going to be posting also on the uh, San Franciscans to save the Castro Theater Facebook group. Uh, we will be posting some more text in the next uh, several days around generating letters to go to the uh, joint commissions, to the planning and um, historic preservation commissions before their hearings. So uh, so the hearings, the key ones are uh, June 6th, the Board of Supervisors, just to remind everybody, and that's in the afternoon. We do want, there won't be any public testimony, but we will be able to go. Um, and wear red. A lot of people are wearing red to indicate their support for saving the seats. Um, and thank you for posting that, uh, Rocket. Um, and then on June 8th, it's in the morning um, at 10 a.m., uh, the uh, joint hearing of the Planning and Historic Preservation Commission will be happening. The most important thing, because there have been thousands of letters generated, um, and uh, so at this point, the most important thing is to physically go, if you can, on June 8th in the morning. Um, we, you know, we really want to ask, uh, I, we feel like that there's too much on the agenda for this particular hearing. It really should be broken up into different hearings. The, there's the conditional use authorization. There's the certificate of appropriateness. We're uh, uh, authorizing the exemptions to the landmarking, taking out the seats, 
putting in these full bars in the theater. We're also authorizing in these hearings to basically convert the theater to a nightclub multi-purpose venue um, that uh, uh, requires a special exemption to the law just for this theater and this company um, to put uh, full bars um, inside uh, full alcohol serving bars inside the theater. So there's a lot on the agenda there. Um, uh, so we really want to show a physical presence. And if you can't be there, at least to call in with your comments. Um, but uh, we really want to show, uh, get a, you know, I'd love to see at least 100 people there that are uh, in favor of saving the seats. Um, possibly they could even see that the recommendations that came from the planning commission uh, staff, with all due respect, are um, uh, uh, not fully baked, um, that we really need to take a deeper look at these questions before the commissions take motion on this. So, so I think showing a, a lot of support through letters and phone calls and physical presence um, is possibly going to make the difference. I hope that the Board of Supervisors does the right thing. We think we're very close to having six votes to protect the seats um, on the 6th, and then it's really gonna, going to fall on the commissions to decide if they want to make a mockery out of landmarking, where landmarking doesn't really mean anything, um, or whether they're going to actually preserve the historic and cultural asset that we have in the middle of our city. So um, so that's why we want people there. So it's not just the people on this call, we want you to reach out to your networks and get people to come as well. Um, and it's really, to me, I, I just feel passionate about this. Um, and a lot of us are spending countless hours of volunteer work um, because, uh, you know, because we grew up in the Castro, um, because we have our own personal stories around it that uh, makes it so important for us in, as individuals. Um, but it goes beyond that. For me, a lot of the younger people don't understand what, they're, what they uh, are losing until it's gone. And as Harvey Milk says, um, or said in his letter about the Castro Theater landmarking, once it's gone, it's gone. You can't bring it back. Um, and um, I think these changes to the interior of the theater, they can't be changed back. Um, and uh, and also the culture can't be brought back. And we've seen that in many other neighborhoods across the city, historically, that once the neighborhoods are displaced and the cultures are displaced, you can't bring them back. Um, and we're really at that tipping point right now, not just in uh, the Castro neighborhood, but in San Francisco. Mm. Yes, thank you, Terry. And one person had asked how to relate their comments to the Secretary of uh, uh, Department of Interior Standards for Historic Preservation. And one of those things is if the, if the change is not reversible. So the Secretary of Interior Standards would dictate that any changes that are made to a historic structure are reversible. You know, so things happen and things do change, but they, they have to be able to be reversed. Removal of the raked floor, as far as my research has shown, is not a reversible action. Um, so, uh, Terry, I have another question here. So, who needs to hear about the lack of community engagement um, by Supervisor uh, Mandelman? Um, no, there was hasn't been a town hall. He hasn't, you know. Can you speak to anything about uh, about uh, the specific supervisors? At this well, point? we did invite Supervisor Mandelman to attend here tonight, and we didn't get a response. Um, it has been problematic. I think there have been some disclosures that he has been uh, for some time working closely with another Planet Entertainment and linking another Planet Entertainment with the planning department. Um, and in, uh, uh, you know, representing that they're the primary stakeholders in this. And, and I think, uh, you know, uh, Raphael Mandelman has met with a number of different community uh, groups along the way, um, but publicly, um, he didn't really like come out with what his position was on uh, saving the seats until fairly recently. And uh, so a lot of folks, I think, are really, I think, rightfully disappointed about that. Um, Jeffrey, maybe you can talk a little bit about um, uh, the two swing votes on the supervisors, the board of supervisors that we're most concerned about right now. Yeah, we we. We uh, one folks reach out to Catherine Stefani and um, uh, Safai, um, 
and that's district uh, uh, district two. Um, so if you're a resident of, the, of those two districts, please reach out to your supervisors um, uh, and engage them and tell them you're a constituent and you care about neighborhood institutions and theaters and, and all both those neighborhoods there have been theater conservancy efforts. Um, uh, please call your supervisor and tell you that as a constituent, you care about these issues and creating community and how folks, how a, a theater is really at the center of a community. Folks going, you know, we remember the afternoons when there were Little Mermaid sing-alongs and, you know, matinee shows every single day, every other day, um, and weekend shows, um, three, at three, three on Saturday and three on Sunday. And that side of the street is totally dark now. Um, you know, when you walk from, when I walk from the edge to Bow, I don't even go on that side of the cast uh, and that And that's sad and that's a detriment to the neighborhood, to civic life, to the businesses that are on that side of the street. Um, and I think to impress upon our supervisors, those quality of life issues, uh, those are issues that we all care about. Yeah, I know Tom, 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 can you address that also? Uh, what do we do about, I love that word that I learned from you uh, when you testified before the Board of Supervisors Committee was nebbish, I think. Yeah. <laughs> what did you mean by that? I got I to gotta figure out what to do here. I just joined again. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're good, Tom. We, we can, can hear, hear you. We can see you. We can oh, hear right. oh, good. you. Uh, yeah. I, I I had to leave for a second, so um, yeah, no, sure. it's, uh, it's a nicer way of saying quizzling. If quizzling was the people <clears throat> in uh, Norway, he was a guy in Norway who was Norwegian, and he cooperated with the Nazis. So Nebisha is a kinder way of saying um, you're all a dither. You cannot focus on anything that's definitive. Uh, you're just you're just a nebbish. Uh, there's no there's no decisiveness. There, there there's no commitment. You're it's it's you're kind of a wash, and um, that that's what I meant. And that's being kind. Um, I have a lot of anger um, at him and and the other people behind him. Um, I did mention uh, in the and I might have missed this. I mentioned Weiner. Um, at, at least, did you did you say he he finally weighed in because he hadn't before? I've talked to him and he didn't want to weigh in. He didn't want to step on Mandelman's. Um, he didn't want to step on Mandelman's territory, which I felt was a cop out. Right? So. Yes, thank you, Tom. Um, so we are going to be uh, wrapping it up pretty soon. And uh, Terry, as the, uh, did you have any more comments that you'd like to make people who are, who are um, with us today? Yeah, um, I think we've said a lot. Um, I just really wanna thank everybody for participating in, in the, uh, uh, as a presenter and as um, audience, I think we had a uh, hundred coming and going at least. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we're really at a critical juncture right now, as we said. Um, and uh, so this is game on time. This is when we can make the difference by making a phone call or writing a letter or showing up. Um, and uh, I think there are some upcoming things. Somebody mentioned in the chat that uh, Jane Fonda is going to be appearing, I think, on the 2nd at the Castro Theater. And we've had difficulty just getting together a couple of people to go to screenings at the Castro Theater and pass out flyers. But when we have, um, and I was down there a couple of times with the uh, Asian um, American uh, uh, Film Festival recently, you know, these are film loving people and they are so supportive. Um, I went up to one woman and she said, well, who's the problem on the Board of Supervisors? And I said, well, we're looking at Stefani and, and Safai as being the swing votes, what we really want right now. And she says, oh, I know Catherine. She texted her right there. And you know, <laughs> I think that's the kind of thing that makes all the difference. Um, it's just people making those personal contacts. So if people can show up, um, I don't know, Jane Fonda does, maybe she wouldn't cross a picket line. I don't know. I mean, it's it's kind of down to the, it's down to, but I've been concerned. I just want to say 
the community has been divided. It's been very painful for a lot of us personally. Um, uh, friendships have been broken over this. Uh, so people are very passionate on both sides um, and maybe rightfully so, but I, I have to say as being on the side of saving the seats that I think that the other side seems to be lacking in information. <laughs> so I, I feel like um, once we get the information out there to people and explain to them what we why we care about this, it can really make it can change minds. Um, some people are never going to change their mind, and that's okay. But uh, uh, but having those personal conversations, getting your butt to the to the hearings, uh, and just taking a moment to send a, a form letter um, is is uh, the least that we can do. Um, but really, what we want is for people to get on their phone and call their friends and try to get them involved as well. So if you're here, we know you care and we love everybody that's involved um, so far. Um, and hopefully we'll uh, all get together and have a party and celebrate the victory in a few months. And, and Terry, if someone does have time to volunteer between now and next week, um, what's the best way for them to get in touch with, with you and Rocket and get plugged into doing a little more? Well, Rocket and I are just uh, two people, you know, that, and we have a few hundred, uh, I think 250 people have joined our Facebook group just in the last week. Um, and we're just, we're allied with the Save the Castro Coalition, which has their own Facebook page um, and website, uh, the Conservancy, um, which they are really the source of the information that we're working with, but we're just trying to help to amplify that by sharing it with our networks and so um so it's really all those things but you can go to our group the san franciscans to save the castro theater um and join invite your friends to join and we will be posting the latest information that we have because we're obsessed you know this is all we do is sit around worrying about the castro theater yeah take, take a look also at save the castro dot uh, org uh Save the Castro Theater.org. Uh, we've got quite a lot of information on that site too. Yes, that's the one I, went, I was referring to. Thank you very much, Peter. We'll put that in the chat. Um, and thank you to all the co sponsors, the Save the Castro Theater Coalition, um, especially Christine with SF Heritage. Thank you so much yeah. for working with us on this. And um, uh, all the other groups and Alex and Rich, thank you so much for being here. And um, uh, I hope we weren't too rough with you. Um, but you haven't seen nothing yet. We'll see you on the eighth. <laughs> and thank you, Peter, and the Castro Theater Conservancy. Uh, you know, we none of us could do any of this without you guys. Oh, thanks, Terry. I just have a couple oh, thank of quick. You, Terry. Quick notes to add before we log off. Um, there's people are still confused at why there's two different meetings, and I agree this process has been very confusing. So one is the June 6th Board of Supervisors meeting. There will not be public comment at that meeting, though we encourage the public to come if you can. More importantly, is the June 8th meeting is a joint meeting of the Historic Preservation Commission and the Planning Commission starts at 10 a.m. special time in City Hall, room 400 and they will be accepting public comment, uh, both in person, by the phone, and letters. And I think it's important, even though you might have sent a letter before, you can go ahead and send another one and participate in this public process, which is so important in uh, determining the future of the historic structures of San Francisco. So I think we've pretty much answered all of the questions that we could at this point. You can always uh, contact uh, any of us uh, through email and Facebook, and we are available to answer more questions. Uh, just to close out, I wanted to thank everyone sincerely for your generous uh, time and your expertise and, and to helping us communicate with the public on this, on this very important issue in San Francisco's history. Terry, did you want to close it out? No, I just want to say thank you, Tom. Uh, appreciate you and every, your history of wonderful work and your passion on this is an inspiration to all of us. And thank you to my partner, Rocket. Oh, yes. Thanks, Rocket. She's in the background. She's been helping me out with all of the, yes, exactly, with all the checks and everything. And Peter, 
have a nice sleep. I know you're far, far away and we really appreciate you uh, waking up in the middle of the night to participate. So again, this webinar will be immediately available, the recording on San Francisco Heritage Facebook page, just check the videos tab, and then we'll be posting it to our YouTube, a San Francisco Heritage YouTube channel, probably in a day or so when I can process that recording, but you can watch it right away on Facebook and share it with your friends. So I wanted to thank everybody for, uh, for joining us today. And I, with that, I think I will end this webinar. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Christine, you're a rock star. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you, have a great night.